Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. My name is Maham Javed, and I'm a journalist, and I'm the current um, International Women's Media Foundation's Elizabeth Newfer Fellow. I was based at MIT Center for International Studies until May, and now I'm working at the New York Times. So let's get into it. TikTok, for me, is the app that I have deleted and reinstalled on my phone tens of times, and that's because I've just never come across a stickier app. So I want to learn from the panelists today what makes TikTok so such an addictive application. Um, in South Asia, TikTok um, is also one of the more controversial apps because it's been banned several times in India and Pakistan since its launch in 2016. And for today's discussion, we want to focus on the various ways in which South Asian women use TikTok. Um, it varies from providing pure entertainment to teaching, to activism, to health messaging, to so much more. Um, and we'll talk about the way TikTok supports this diversity, but also the ways in which it limits this diversity. Um, so before we begin, I just want to wake us all up. Um, so I'm going to show us, I'm going to show you all a few TikToks just for a few minutes. Um, this is especially for the handful of us who have been blessed to never come across this very addictive app. And uh, after I show you the apps, I'm going to introduce the panel. Um, and then we're going to launch into a discussion. And then we're going to conclude with questions from the audience. So let's start watching the TikToks. And we're going to start with my personal favorite TikTok genre, which I have personally named. And I like to call them allegedly romantic TikToks. Because as you see, when I share my screen, they're not actually romantic, but people would like you to believe otherwise. So let's start. When you use Constant Contact, prepare accordingly. Prepare! <laughs> So as you can see, I mean, yeah, it would be ideal if you could understand the lyrics of the songs in the back, but even without that, most of them work. <laughs> Already, you must be getting a small flavor of how diverse these can be. Assalamu alaikum, kaise hain sab tik tak hai? Main bhi tik tak hoon. Acha ji, aaj ek aur fata fat se main aapko ek recipe deti hoon. Thik hai? Iske liye hume chahiye honge ye tortilla wraps. Thik hai? Ye pure gold shape mein aate hain. Thik hai? Isko jo hai ham gold shape se jo hai char pieces mein cut ke is tar to ye wale jo hai pizza ke tarah ke na piece banana lenge. Thik hai? पाकिस्तान के कुलचे याद है सबको 
तो हम आज वो वाले तो नहीं बनाएंगे लेकिन हम चुटेला के जो है कुलचे बनाने की कोशिश करते हैं ठीक है इन ताला बहुत टेस्टी होते हैं और बहुत इजी और सिंपल है ठीक है उसके लिए मैंने क्या किया है यहाँ पे जो है मैंने छोटा छोटा आलू प्याज जो है उसको काटा है ठीक है और ये जो है ये पाले पे ठीक है इसको भी आपने पतला पतला सा इसको कर लेना है स्लाइस ठीक है यहाँ पे जो है अनारदाना गरम मसाला देखा दिमाग ब्लैंक हो गया धनिया पाउडर लाल मिर्च हल्दी नमक और क्रश्ड रेड चिली ठीक है ये सारे मसाले चाट मसाला नेशनल का चाट मसाला है और कलवंजी ठीक है और डेफिनेटली बेसन ठीक है इन सब को जो है हम इसमें मिक्स कर लेंगे हमने वो जो टिटेला रैप थे वो इसके अंदर भी गो के अब इसको जो है तेल में बस डाल देंगे ठीक है बहुत मजे के हैं चटनी के साथ खाएं लाजमी ट्राई कीजिएगा थैंक यू सो मच अल्लाह हाफिज अस्सलाम those two worked in really well direct contrast and then we have sorry about that so often it's important to watch a few tiktoks of the same person to kind of get what collective theme they're trying to hit at so i thought i'll show you a couple of couples and then we're going to end with this one <laughs> Okay so yeah so that was just a small taste of what TikTok can offer um and yeah as you could tell there was a wide variety in there so now i'm going to introduce the panelist uh, we'll start with ramsha uh, ramsha jangir is a journalist and a researcher and i'll let her introduce her research to you Hi everyone. I am so so excited and stoked to be here. Um not because I like talking about technology but because TikTok is a platform that's very very new to me. I'm very guilty of downloading it very late. Usually I cover technology and human rights on Twitter and Facebook in Pakistan and I cover digital politics. So TikTok has been something that I've been avoiding for a while but I'm thankful to Maham to push me and ask me to research a bit for this panel specifically on how are women using TikTok in Pakistan specifically and also across South Asia. And since I'm based abroad right now for my masters as an Erasmus Mundus scholar, I'm missing home. And I think that's my for you page. That's why my for you page on TikTok took me to what I call the Gharelu side of TikTok, the how where there. from moms to housewives to totkas they see life culture everything i think i found on tiktok and of course we'll talk more in detail about 
what specifically fascinated me, but TikTok is fascinatingly where I'm going to stay at now because it's not only connected me to home, but also made me realize the diversity of content and the quality of content is not always always comes with sophistication, but also it's just who you are and what home is to you, what your culture is to you, what you find of interest. Um, so yeah, be it recipes, be it like some TikToks we recently saw, like your daily schedule, like you work all day or you're cooking all day or just Desi culture in itself is is what gets the numbers. So yeah, I'd like to talk about that more in detail and also hopefully hear what other women have to share on the subject. Thanks, Ramsha. Now we're going to move to Sachini Pereira. She is the uh, executive coordinator of research and she's a researcher uh, and an activist. Thanks, Maham. And hi, everyone. A um, bit early in the morning for me, but uh, I'm here. Um, so um, I'm a queer feminist activist and researcher from Sri Lanka. And I'm part of a feminist Global South feminist collective called Realizing Sexual and Reproductive Justice. Um, and I would say more than anything, I'm a TikTok enthusiast. I've been watching it since, I think, 2017 or so. And then around 2018 to 19, I um, wrote a paper about it also, which really helped me like, you know, one, you know, like also channel my enthusiasm into, you know, something productive. Uh, but at the same time, I think also like um, unpack some of my position in as a feminist researcher, but also as a middle class woman and how I, you know, like how I approach the uh, platform and, you know, like the ways I um, engage with it. Um, and uh, I'll just uh, also make a disclaimer that, you know, some of what I'm talking about is like uh, specifically about Sinhala language uh, TikTok in Sri Lanka. Uh, there is also Tamil language uh, TikTok, uh, but I don't, um, I know very little Tamil. And uh, so because of that, I'm not engaging with that uh, part of TikTok in uh, Sri Lanka. Um, and I'm also not sharing videos um, when I'm talking about the work, because this is also a reflection we had after the first conference paper that me and another feminist researcher, Minoli Vijaytunga, that we presented um, in 2018, because I think one, me as a middle class woman interpreting the content of mostly working class creators, um, like, you know, what are the power dynamics there and, you know, and then also do they intend for their videos to be shared in a panel or a conference and for people to dissect them. Um, so, and then also, you know, like what it means to be public uh, uh, on the internet and what that means for uh, feminist research ethics, you know, like, because I think it's very like, you know, we can simplify it saying um, it's it's in the public domain or like, you know, it's been publicly posted and we can um, share it and talk about it. But at the same time, I think we have to think about the like the fault lines around this where, you know, is there informed consent for it to go beyond the uh, uh, platforms or for us as researchers, what does it uh, mean for us to uh, take this and talk about them? Um, so um, I think I have I have a bit of time, right? Um, yeah, okay. So I'll just talk of like I'll share a few snapshots. So earlier this year, there was a TikTok of a teledrama, like a television actress who was taking a break during shooting a teledrama. She's in costume, dressed as a corpse. So she's in a white sari with white gloves and like white makeup. And uh, so she and the crew made a TikTok uh, dancing in a, like in that costume in a coffin where you know she wakes up in the coffin. Um, and there was a lot of outrage about this on Instagram and Twitter that, you know, that this is not appropriate. Um, and um, I, you know, like it makes you wonder if she was doing this as, you know, part of a performance that she's been paid for that, like, you know, that she's doing as part of her work, would there be similar outrage? Um, then last year, uh, there is a TikTok influencer uh, who is in Sinhala language like uh, TikTok, uh, who really built her profile on TikTok and is uh, now a very popular streamer on Facebook gaming, um, where she, you know, plays PUBG. 
and a lot of these like you know like her streams get uh, again like moved to uh, TikTok, get cross posted. Um, so the famous like song Ek Bar, right? Like which was trending on TikTok. So um, so while playing, people request her to dance to this, and when she dances, she gets more like of the star donations that you get. Uh, so clearly, this is an income generation, like um, like an avenue of income generation for her. And her dance into this, and like you know, this there was this one particular person who was giving her a lot of like uh, star donations, and this went viral. Um, and like for many reasons, for the like for her mannerisms, the way she talks, what she was dressed in, uh, and then this got memed, uh, and you know, like she was part of the like you know, she was also part of like laughing at this. But uh, then it went on national television with like child psychologists and doctors like taking this video and analyzing it to like you know talk about game addiction and like to talk about you know like oh is this like you know like is she like is someone making her do this like all of these questions being asked even though she has been a content creator for many years so when she went into this domain of gaming and then when she was like using this for like when she was monetizing this it suddenly became this like you know larger conversation um in 2020, I was watching this uh, trans woman sex worker um, who like, you know, who uh, like shares her number and like, you know, who solicits on TikTok, uh, using TikTok. Um, and she was on TikTok live doing this unboxing uh, video of sex toys. And I have never in my life seen someone do an unboxing of sex toys in Singhala. Like, this is the first time I saw it. And um, and it was like the best, like I work in sexual and reproductive rights and I have to say it's the best like sex ed uh, video I have ever seen because she was taking out each toy, uh, discussing the functions, uh, trying them like, you know, like taking a harness out and saying which way does it go and then the people in the comments are like, oh, try it this way, try it that way. Um, and at the same time, you know, people are asking her like, you know, like, uh, like sending the, like transphobic comments in the uh, chat and uh, so she's saying your words are not how I uh, earn a living like in Singhala she's telling them this and then when people are asking like intrusive questions about her genitals then she's like um, I mean uh, if you want to know come to my Pornhub live and then you can find out for yourself um, so that's another moment and then during the pandemic we had a lot of women migrant workers in the gulf uh, who started joining uh, tiktok to um, share their working conditions to share like this like to find community because you know you were not able to come home you can't leave the houses you were working in because uh, because of the pandemic restrictions uh, so they were doing videos like debunking some myths about like being abroad and working abroad uh, like you know like uh, sharing how a salary gets divided like you know like someone taking the salary and making a uh, TikTok to file it up to say this much goes to like you know my family this much goes to someone else and this is what I'm left with again like you know like it was a lot of like insight into what a migrant uh, worker goes through that we really don't get through like a lot of the time we like you know hear hear about it when someone has gone through violence and that's how we hear about what uh, the conditions are like and this was them taking ownership of that narrative and talking about it themselves um so i think i'll stop there for now and then later i can talk about the paper that we did in 2018, 2019 about how, um, like uh, going a little deeper into some of these uh, things. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sachini. Um, and yeah, really interesting. And um, thank you for sharing that idea of like, when does public become too public, right? And I, I would love to talk further about that. Um, so next on the panel, we have Sidra Kamran. She's an incoming assistant professor at Lewis and Clark, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about herself and her research. Hi, everyone. Thanks for inviting me, Maham. I'll just talk a little bit about how I came to do this research and then just give an overview of the broad things that I look at. Um, so I am not a social media enthusiast or anything, and it was quite accidental how I came upon it. I was doing research for my dissertation, which is basically an ethnography of a women in Karachi who work in beauty salons and in department stores as retail workers. And I was doing ethnography at a women-only bazaar in Karachi called Mina Bazaar. And at the end of 2018, TikTok sort of burst onto the scene, but only in Mina Bazaar. So I was teaching at a university. I was coming you know, home to my friends who were from more privileged backgrounds, and they had not heard of TikTok, 
But all the women I was spending time with in Mina Bazaar were fascinated by TikTok. And I also downloaded it at the beginning of January, 2019, I think. And just to explain my fascination, which I then think became a national and global fascination with the app, is that I had been doing fieldwork for some months and women had Facebook accounts and they used WhatsApp, but they did things that we know women in a lot of South Asian and Middle Eastern contexts do, right? They didn't put their faces on their Facebook profile photos or they used a photo of their son or they had a fake name or a fake account. And there is this censorship of women's visibility on social media that we're quite used to in Middle Eastern and South Asian contexts. And on TikTok, if I was going through it and there was an endless stream of really beautiful women lip syncing to Bollywood songs, decked out, and uh, quite a lot of display of sexualized femininities. So that is what immediately struck me. And I then began to research it independently. And the other thing that struck me right away was, so I started interviewing beauty workers and also owners of beauty salons or women who were middle-class uh, professionals. And when I asked them about TikTok, either they didn't know anything about it, this is in the very beginning. And then in 2020, when everyone kind of knew about TikTok, I asked them, oh, do you advertise your salon on TikTok? And they would say no, or they would laugh. Or one woman was offended that I asked her that. Uh, the other woman said, I hate TikTok, which I think is a bit of a strong reaction to a social media app. But I think we're also familiar that TikTok in the beginning had a kind of um, reception in Pakistan. And I think in South Asia in general, that was refracted across class lines. So a retail worker who I spoke to described having a craze for the app. And then the middle-class professionals I'm speaking to are kind of cringing at the app or describing it as cheap. So then I started looking at, at this kind of class disruption of social media apps. And I think to some extent, Bego is another example that suggests that. So one of the main things I look at is how does this class association change over time? So now I think TikTok is quite mainstreamed. And I think partially it's because of the global popularity of TikTok, right? In the West or celebrity culture. The second thing I look at is how TikTok enables women and sexual minorities to engage in a range of gender transgressions. So the first one that comes to mind, and you saw that in some of the TikToks, is a display of sexualized femininities. And I think TikTok is really the first time we're seeing this uh, kind of sexual agency of ordinary women mainstreamed on such a large scale. Because of course you might have celebrities and of course you have women on Instagram also you know, exhibiting sexualized femininities. But I think TikTok has really um, mainstreamed this in an unprecedented way. And the third thing that I look at is that even though there is this gender transgressions happening on TikTok that we're familiar with, at the same time, women are also performing what we may call digital parda on TikTok. And you know, other researchers have studied this. So in Pakistan, in Azerbaijan, in the Middle East, in South Asia in general, there are a lot of ways women mediate their access to social media or how they perform their identity on social media. So as I mentioned before, you might not put your own photo or you might specifically uh, put a photo that shows you as respectable or demure or not, or sexually modest, or a sexually modest photo, or you might have restricted settings, or one study finds that women prefer to use WhatsApp rather than Facebook because it's more private. So what I look at is uh, what are the specific ways women are negotiating their entry into the digital public sphere through practices of digital parda? And I can talk about that later, but uh, one video we saw earlier of how women will not really show their face, but find really creative ways to show certain body parts or their disguised identity. And relatedly, um, what I think about is, is that, you know, typically we think about uh, digital parda in relation to sexual modesty. So that's what studies are showing. And, you know, women are trying to maintain respectability by engaging in digital parda. But what I think is happening on TikTok is that women are actually using digital parda to simultaneously exhibit sexual agency. And I think that's something that we can get into later when maybe we have a chance to talk about a specific TikToks at length. Yeah, Siddha, that was very tantalizing. Uh, placing a question there and then not giving us an answer. Uh, we'll definitely come back to talking more about digital parda, which is a, the perfect term for what we've been seeing for years, right? Like flowers as a Facebook profile picture. Um, okay, next we will, uh, I'm going to introduce Satveer Kaur Gill. Uh, she is a postdoctoral research fellow with the Dartmouth Institute and she's based in Singapore. 
Thank you, Maham. Um, thank you, Maham, for the opportunity as well. So um, just to sort of give you a bit of a background of how I came uh, to be on TikTok, um, again, it was pretty accidental. Um, I'm actually a critical health communication scholar studying the relationship between structural conditions of precarious migrant labor and health marginalization. Uh, when I say precarious migrant labor in the context of Singapore, I'm referring to construction workers as well as domestic workers. But for this presentation specifically, I'll be talking about South Asian migrant domestic workers. Um, so the ways in which I look at their health violence and how it's connected to the nested precarities of migrant living and working conditions in Singapore um, to understand how uh, health um, is deeply interconnected uh, with these precarious work and living conditions. During the pandemic, um, migrant domestic workers and migrant construction workers not just face immobility, they began facing extreme immobility because now they were placed in, migrant construction workers were placed in extended um, lockdowns um, right up till now. Uh, they, are, they have restricted movements placed on them compared to the rest of the population. And during the pandemic, um, in the peri-pandemic, migrant domestic workers were not allowed to take their one-off day. They, were not, they had to sort of work with, within their employer's home or within the confines of their employers, whom they already work with from Monday to, Saturday, um, Monday to Saturday. But now on Sunday, they were not allowed to leave their employer's home. They had to take their rest day within the employer's home, which once again poses a lot of problematic scenarios for their mental health and so on. So um, while I was interviewing workers and doing my field work through various digital means, workers would send me TikTok videos of some of their precarious conditions, uh, some more extreme, um, some cases of abuse, uh, physical abuse, um, mental abuse, verbal abuse that they were facing, and they were putting this on TikTok. Uh, they were using TikTok as a means to digitally record, keep. Uh, some of these precarious conditions that they face, while of course at other times using it for entertainment. But even in um, sort of using TikTok for the purposes of entertainment, they sort of show and describe a lot of the uh, conditions in which uh, they work in. Um, again, because of the hyper invisibility they face in the Singapore context where they are erased from mainstream spaces, TikTok became such an important means in which they could socially construct um, some of their narratives, uh, whether it's for, again for entertainment or help seeking behaviors, it became really important to look at the medium um, as a means to see the kinds of stories they were telling. Um, I will, if, if you had more questions to ask about um, the nature of their work, uh, I'll, I, I'm happy to answer them later, but I sort of want to talk about the ways in which uh, they live and work in precarity chains, such as debt threats, the limited rest days, round-the-clock labor, employer surveillance, and limited labor protections make um, them visible on TikTok or them using TikTok as a very important means for pl platform activism um, and them enacting their agency in ways that are visible um, where they are erased in other contexts. So for South Asian domestic work workers in particular, um, in my previous study, uh, what we find is that because the South Asian domestic workers form a much smaller population community in Singapore, and because they are so diverse, coming from many different parts of South Asia, uh, help seeking can often be challenging. So they might get into scenarios of deceptions and trafficking traps where they come to Singapore thinking that they are here to perform migrant domestic work but end up in sex work. So um, you have those sorts of trafficking traps that take place, again, um, without a wider social network that other domestic workers have, such as from the Philippines and Indonesia, where there's a much bigger community of migrant workers that uh, they can receive uh, information from or retrieve uh, the resources that they need. Um, and then you have the communicative violence that South Asian domestic workers um, uh, experience, often verbal abuse with a lot of caste scripts um, used by employers, agents, and gatekeepers in that process. So this is particularly unique um, to South Asian domestic workers in Singapore. So for example, some of the um, domestic workers I personally worked with are domestic workers that have run away from their employer's home from in some way or another because of precarious conditions. And um, 
they only are, they only sort of run away at the very extreme moment where things have become extremely intense um, and they just run um, without any help resources guiding them. Um, and in that process, what was interesting to find out was, for example, if it was a Sikh Punjabi domestic worker, she would know, okay, I need to go to the Gudwara. Gudwara is a site where I can receive help. But a Punjabi Christian domestic worker there's no real um, space in which uh, that exists in Singapore where that social support might exist or that idea of social support might exist uh, for this domestic worker. So that's where you see a lot of um, cases of abuse that go completely um, hidden or erased um, from, uh, again, um, a civil society organizing and so on. So on TikTok, what has been interesting is that a lot of the cultural expressions as well as the structural expressions of precarity uh, have been record kept. So while they might not be able to post it in that moment, they post it at a later time, especially during the pandemic where there were a lot of violations. Uh, they were also able to self-represent, construct online identities and organize digitally for help seeking. So you would see, for example, in some ephemeral videos that have been taken down, um, where migrant domestic workers are posted with um, some of the abuse that they face and then uh, find ways to seek help in those conditions. Um, and the relevance of audio memes uh, in the storytelling narratives of migrant domestic workers is also very interesting to pay attention to uh, because these audio memes tell us, uh, give us the effect of the kinds of feelings and emotions they convey. Uh, another thing that has been interesting about TikTok is the vernacular nature in which migrant domestic workers were able to share their stories. So because it moves away from dominant forms of knowledge production uh, to more textual, moving away from more textual formats to adopting a whole variety of different formats to build your story, um, it has become a medium in which migrant workers are pretty active on. Uh, so with that, I want to keep time. Um, uh, feel free to ask me any further questions at the end of this talk yeah thank you thank you Satveer. yeah it was i mean again i'm just constantly blown away by the diverse ways in which we in which women and you know use tiktok um you know this is another way of like resources is another way in which tiktok is used to share resources um and then our last but not the least uh, our, our final panelist is sujata subramanian uh, she is a PhD candidate at Ohio State University. Um, okay, so uh, like Maham introduced me, um, I'm Sujata Subramanian and I am doing my PhD in the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at the Ohio State University. Um, so my different research projects over the years have specifically focused on um, girls' expressions and practices of sexuality and how they express intimacy, friendship, and belonging. Um, and it's part of this inquiry that I have also looked at how girls use um, technology and how they use social media. And I think a lot of what um, I, I want to discuss and what I have found um, has resonances with what the other speakers uh, have pointed out, and especially Sidra's work, um, I think there are a lot of connections there. Um, because something that I have found um, in how young women's use of technology is understood is the pervasive uh, sort of moral panic associated with the use of technology, regardless of which technology they use. And I think my favorite example for this is how when cycles uh, bicycles first came about in the late 19th and early 20th century. There were moral panics around young women's, you know, use of cycles. Um, and we saw the same thing happen with selfies where, you know, selfies were believed to um, cause narcissism and low self-esteem in women, in young women specifically. And, um, and so is the case with TikTok. So, um, um, I have to admit that I um, am not, I think of all the social media platforms, I'm the least familiar with TikTok. Um, I've never had an account on TikTok and I think I mostly just have looked at the different videos. Um, but even before I went on TikTok, I was um, getting to hear a lot about TikTok and a lot of this was associated with the moral panic um, around young women's use of TikTok. So, um, you know, there were politicians talking about how TikTok causes cultural degradation in society, how it leads to sexual perversity. 
um, you know, um, some a news agency described TikTok as showing scantily clad girls dancing to vulgar tunes. Um, and of course, these girls are from the narrow, dingy bylanes of small towns. So again, um, connecting to Sidra's work around how, um, you know, a lot of um, the commentary around TikTok has also pointed out the class divide um, in when it comes to uh, who are the people who are using TikTok. Um, so uh, I first went on TikTok after a friend of mine from Bhim Army, which is an anti-caste organization based in India. Um, uh, he shared a TikTok um, that he was uh, that he had created uh, where he was celebrating Ambedkar Jayanti, um, and he uh, had shared it with a number of hashtags like um, Jai Bhim, Jat of Pride. Um, and to me, this was really interesting because until then, I had heard of Twitter, Instagram, even Facebook um, being used for uh, the creation of anti-caste content, for the creation for for you know activism, but I hadn't really um, heard or read much about how TikTok was being used. Um, and so once he shared this video with me, um, I uh, clicked on the hashtags and you know went down the rabbit hole of videos, so to speak. Um, and to me, what was fascinating was the number of young women who were also creating such content um, and who were creating content around caste. Um, and what was interesting was that uh, the videos they were creating continued to have themes of romance and intimacy, right? Uh, so a number of them were using um, Bollywood songs around Pyar and Mohabbat, for example. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking of what Maham said about, you know, the apparently uh, romantic videos or the allegedly romantic videos, because when you uh, look at these videos and when you go beyond, uh, you know, just hearing the audio um, and, and you also focus on how video is being used, um, um, you see that even though these songs are talking about Pyar and Mohabbat, uh, these messages of Pyar and Mohabbat were, you know, being directed to anti-caste leaders like Dr. Ambedkar or um, the, the head of the Bhim Army, um, Chandrasekhar Azad. Um, so again, um, I think we uh, tend to focus so much on how young women are using um, social media platforms like TikTok um, for fun and pleasure that, um, uh, you know, we sometimes end up missing such use of social media to also, um, you know, how we also end up missing how young women are using social media to create content around caste, right? Um, and I think my question is in a context where young people from oppressed caste communities and um, specifically from Dalit communities are being murdered for, you know, something as um, for something as small as having a ringtone on uh, Dr. Ambedkar, what does it mean for young women to be using social media platforms and for uh, them to be using TikTok uh, to not just talk about their caste identities, but to also assert pride in their oppressed caste uh, identities, right? And why is it that um, such use of um, social media platforms and such use of TikTok by young women is not uh, being recognized as anti-caste activism. And again, I want to reiterate that that's not to say that young women are um, not using TikTok for fun and pleasure because the very uh, young women who are creating content around, um, you know, Ambedkar or, or Chandrasekhar Azad um, are also creating videos around um, makeup or, uh, you know, are creating videos where they're dancing to Bollywood songs. Um, but I guess um, what my research tries to do and, and what I'm interested in is to maybe explore um, a fuller range of how um, young women are using social media platforms um, and also to maybe uh, then ask the question of what actually constitutes activism, right? What are the expressions that uh, we count as activism or what are the expressions and actions that we define as activism and who are the people who we recognize as activists? Um, so that is my work in brief. And like I said, um, I'm not very familiar with TikTok yet and that is something I hope to remedy in the coming years and months. Thank you. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Sajata. Um, what I was going to say was, it's also really interesting to, to like kind of consider what all the panelists have said and a bunch of them, like, you know, many of us have also said, oh yeah, but you know, we don't use TikTok and that's not a, we, we are, I don't think any of us are saying it in a defensive way, but I think there is like, um, there is a, there is like something along class lines, TikTok is not yet a necessity, the way Facebook was a necessity, the way Twitter and, well, Twitter less, but Instagram and Facebook became necessities for certain classes. So TikTok has not yet crossed that 
that that boundary uh, for certain classes. Um, okay. So thank you so much for that. Thanks everyone for introducing themselves and their work. Um, and yeah, let's, um, I'm gonna just ask a question. Um, and I think a lot of us are gonna have a lot to say about it. So, you know, let's just kind of, okay. So, you know, after hearing everyone's research topics um, and, you know, listening to all of the research that you've done, it's obvious that women in South Asia are using TikTok in various ways. Um, but then what, what I was thinking while I was listening to all of you is that a lot of social media is used in different ways, right? So like, for example, YouTube is also used um, for like, everything from cooking recipes to technology, you know, how to's to, um, again, activism, right? So what is it about TikTok that makes it more addictive, more controversial, and more exciting? Like, why did TikTok become so much more of a rage than YouTube did in South Asia? Whoever wants to go. <laughs> okay, um, I'll take the lead. Um, and hopefully keep it short. Um, I think what sets what fascinates me about TikTok is how different, like you said, but I don't think TikTok is social media. It's very personal. It's not like you see vacation photos or filtered photos or um, influencer culture is also very, very personal. Everyone is presenting and true to who they are. Um, so on the For You page, you see all these different diverse types of women that we've talked about and from all classes, all of them together in your For You page, but as who they are. And that's what's very fascinating. And I think this is another thing is the tech um, literacy aspect. So for, so for YouTube, you need a nice camera. For Instagram, you need to understand how Reels, I'm not just re Reels is obviously like TikTok, but just like the filter aspect. There is a, an aspect of tech li literacy that's involved, but the short format of TikTok makes it so easy for anyone to just pick up their phone and, and convey whatever they wanna show. And you can be creative. You can just talk about your life. So for instance, the TikToks I've been looking at women are basically just talking about okay if they had a fight with a husband they're talking about that if they have a cooking recipe to share they're talking about that if they have one of the tiktoks we saw earlier is a woman just sharing her day her schedule so she's tired she thinks she's work overworked she's sharing that there's also a not tiktok so in the religious context as well um, there are women just reciting knots because they think they're good at it and then people are listening and then they're sharing. If someone's going for Umrah, then they're praying on behalf of all their followers. So it's just these tiny aspects of your personal life that TikTok's allow, uh, TikTok allows you to share in a very, very short, quick, easy tech literate format and you don't need a fancy camera or something that you would perhaps for a good YouTube video. To, to do that. So I think that really, really sets TikTok apart from the rest of social media. But yeah, it's a very personal app, I think. Um, can I add to this? Um, I agree with Ramsha and I think in addition to tech literacy, I think there's also language literacy that comes into uh, the picture. And I think the fact that TikTok doesn't um, really rely on a lot of text-based content, um, unlike something like Twitter, which is almost exclusively, um, you know, relying on text-based content means that users who are, um, you know, not maybe uh, very familiar with English or in general are not, um, you know, uh, who don't express themselves through text are using TikTok. Um, but I think I, I do sort of wonder if TikTok is exceptional in terms of social media, in terms of um, you know, women adopting or women using um, TikTok, because I feel like um, women have been early adopters of most forms of technology, including social media. And like I said, I think my earlier research was looking at selfies, and it was the same set of fears that was associated with, you know, selfies being shared on Facebook back then, and then Instagram, etc. Um, and I think uh, women also are able to adapt. So the fact that now TikTok is banned in India, I was recently reading about how YouTube shorts is apparently the next thing. And there are a number of users who um, have moved from TikTok to YouTube shorts. So I'm curious to see um, how that platform will probably be used. And, and again, what sort of narratives 
um, that we give birth to, I guess. Um, is it okay if I also respond? Yes. Yes, please. Um, yeah, I think I agree with like a like a couple of the things around the design and tech part because the barriers for entry are very low for TikTok in terms of uh, the design, the language, uh, even the user experience. Because you know, if you go through TikTok, there are very little distractions because it's basically just showing you the entire video, and you can't really like you know like bring other platforms into uh, TikTok the same way you can on like, you know, for an example on um, uh, Twitter, for an example. Um, and I think TikTok Lite, uh, the, that app uh, being available, which again, like, you know, you, like where by default, uh, the usage of data is very low. And I think they are really looking at, you know, those who may use prepaid uh, data plans and like, you know, the kind of like uh, data consumption there might be around that. Um, and I don't know whether it's more exciting or more controversial. I think it's really like this, like a lot of the time the work, like the word you hear is cringe, right? Like, uh, because a lot of people say TikTok is very cringy. And like, you know, this is uh, like a word that I hear a lot. And I think it says a lot more about the people who are watching than the people who are uh, performing or who are creating content. And I'll very quickly just share like, you know, like a, a quote by um, uh, Fun Bucket Bar Bargav. So he's a performer from uh, South India. And one of the things he said about TikTok, which I thought was like a moment of clarity for me, because someone asked him, what makes TikTok different from other social media? And he said, uh, everyone in India is on it. This was before it was banned, uh, because it's very easy to use, very accessible, and even making videos on it is quite simple. But I think the main reason it is so popular with almost every generation is that even illiterate people can use the app and don't necessarily need to know how to speak English since it accommodates regional languages as well. And um, other platforms like Instagram and Twitter are also important, but we don't get the same reach like we would on TikTok because the audience at the other places are more literate, sophisticated, and can't really understand us. And I think the can't really understand us is really like, you know, what drove it home for me because um, that's the point, right? Because a lot of the time when we say that, or oh, TikTok doesn't like have the same like appeal or isn't as important, we are really talking about it from like a different uh, perspective, whatever your privileges might be in terms of languages, the tech you use, your class, you're talking about it in those terms. Whereas I really like it when he subverts it. I don't think he means it in a like a funny or like a um, uh, sassy way, but he really says, yeah, people can't understand us. And that is why they are like, you know, laughing at this or considering this space. Yeah. Okay. Um, actually, I'm going to um, stay here for a minute. And Sachini, I don't know, I would love to hear more about this idea um, of like, I don't know, could you tell us a little bit more about I guess perceptions of TikTok is one way to put it. Um, you know, you've brought this up twice, this, again, this idea of like, can't really understand us. Um, I don't know, in, in terms of like what Ramsha said, right? That TikTok is very personal and it's almost like a diary of sorts for some people, for some users, right? Like you're sharing um, something personal and something like very your innermost, you're expressing your innermost feelings or desires or, you know. Um, and the reason you are doing it, whenever you share something, when you put something out into the world, the idea is that you hope to connect to people and that you hope that somebody will understand it, right? So the hope or the desire that's there when people launch these TikToks into the world is that someone will connect and understand. Um, but of course, some people will also misunderstand. What I'm trying to get at is, I guess, how do creators balance that in your view? Um, and also this idea of like, even if we don't fully understand something the way it was meant to be understand, can we still keep consuming it ethically? I'm kind of gonna chime in very quickly on this question because I have struggled with this uh, immensely when doing this research. Um, 
especially when migrant workers are telling stories that uh, we don't know the intention, right? Whether is it to organize, is it to activate, uh, or is it just to share within their own networks? Um, and when I'm, I've worked on a publication of uh, on sh talking about some of this content, and a big thing that gets to me is the ethics of gazing um, and what are the consequences. So in Singapore, yesterday, um, a migrant worker was deported back home because he had written a poem talking about the conditions of his precarity during the pandemic. Um, the ministry circulated a very strong statement to say he has overstayed his welcome. Um, and the fact that we still allowed him to stay here for this long, um, despite his activism, was already uh, kind enough. Um, the, when I saw that, the first thing that came to my mind was my own work with migrant workers, where I am writing about their TikTok um, use. Um, and what that what implications could that have for greater surveillance on migrant workers in Singapore by the state? Um, and that's where I keep questioning whether maybe uh, there isn't a place for me to do this research. Um, maybe talking about some of these stories through research uh, might do much more harm broadly um, than good uh, in talking about uh, their precarious conditions. So this is something I struggle with and I agree with Sachin in her presentation where she talked about um, what are the consequences of our gazing, you know, are we putting our participants at risk? Um, and those questions are a part of like the reflexivity I think we need to do when working with uh, marginalized populations. Yeah, I don't have an answer, but yeah, that's something too, that is quite important to think about. Maham, I can also chime in just to link the first question you asked about the appeal of TikTok and this, which is not to answer directly, but to introduce another dimension. You're saying that, you know, people put TikTok because, TikToks because they want to connect with people. And what I find is part of the reason for TikTok's uh, broad appeal is that TikTok actually isn't necessarily, doesn't need to be a public platform. So when I was hanging out with the beauty workers, it's not that they were uploading their videos on TikTok every time for a long time, especially when they first start, they're just making it and they're just consuming it for themselves. So they'll go to their aunt's house and you know they'll use the whatever location to make a bunch of videos, come home, watch them on repeat. It's got nothing to do with the audience. And I think that's kind of why it became so popular because there are so many modes of expressing your creativity in it that don't necessarily require an audience. So one is this really private consumption of TikToks that I find, right? That I wouldn't have known about if I was just on the app. It's just that I happen to be with the women using TikTok like that. And then the other way they use it is also cross-platforming. So they'll use TikTok to make the videos, but they won't put them on TikTok, but just put them on WhatsApp statuses. So it creates, you know, another dimension of a mid-level public realm. And they can control who sees it. Sort of, sort of straddling the line between wanting to be seen, but it's also something very much they're doing for themselves. Or you know, they might just send send the videos to their boyfriends or to their friends or show them in real time. So that's just another dimension that I think is kind of not really thought about when we think about TikTok. It's not just what's happening on the public realm. Interesting. Thanks for that. Um, does anyone have anything to add? Otherwise, I want to move to one more dimension and then we're going to move to questions from the audience. If I can add something, unless Sujata wants to speak. Um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think also the fact that it's there are different ways of like, I feel as if it like TikTok really and also like reels and like you know one of the, like the other like modes that are really used for this kind of content creation it shifts the way we think about the personal the private and the public because some of the tiktokers we talked to like early on before you know tiktok became so much bigger you're filming something in your bedroom your family doesn't know that you're filming this and putting it on the internet so um, at the same time, what is, you know, a very private for you in within your family, like, you know, you're putting it out for other people to see and, uh, and people had a very like, you know, like, uh, the young women, like, you know, all had like, they, they knew that, you know, this was happening and that there was a 
safety in that public that you wouldn't have in the privacy of your home. And then there was also like, I don't think this happens anymore, but in the beginning, there were these things called TikTok meetups where uh, TikTokers would come together in a public space and then you perform and you film things together. And there are all these like, you know, like you're doing like collaborations, right? And this not only moves the performance from the privacy of a home to the public space, but is also like promoting women just performing in public spaces just for fun and not in a professional capacity, which is, you know, how it's usually like more acceptable. So I think that's also just something to remember that like, you know, in terms of how your family may be using technology, like, you know, then it creates this other pockets of privacy or personal spaces that may not be, you know, that that may not fall into how we understand these spheres usually. Sorry. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So since we're out of time, we're still going to stay on just for 15 more minutes and take some questions from the audience. Um, before I do that, in case people leave, um, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank all the panelists. And I especially want to thank um, Michelle English um, from CIS, from MIT's Center of International Studies, and Abigail from MIT India, who, you know, helped host this. Um, and yeah, now, you know, I'm happy to take questions from the audience. So, um, okay, so the first question is from Priyanka. And it is, she says that, okay, um, she's asking um, what is specifically TikTok enabling for women in South Asia that other social media applications such as Facebook and Instagram are not? Um, I think we have a little bit covered this. If there's something that somebody says, um, she might have asked us, yeah, she asked us way early on. So let's, I think we've covered this to a fair degree. Okay, so this one's for Sujata and Sitra. How did these women gain the confidence and what enabled them to move from using uh, flowers as their DPs on Facebook to lip syncing and dancing um, on music? Um, you know, how, how do you, I guess they're asking, how did they make that transition? Yeah, if Sidra and Sujata have some insight in this. Um, so I think the way I understand it is something that other speakers have brought up in terms of how um, young women are uh, in very sophisticated ways kind of managing their audience and they're managing, um, you know, what, who they consider um, as the public who should be consuming these videos. And um, like Sachini pointed out, um, I think a lot of that audience management is around, um, you know, their family um, and, and making sure that their family doesn't know uh, what, how they're using their phones or how they're using these apps. And again, that's something that I've seen um, even with other social media platforms. So like, for example, Facebook, um, a, a young woman might have a profile with, you know, the demure like flower kissing uh, display picture. And maybe that's the profile that um, she makes available to her family and her family thinks that's her main profile, but she would also have Another profile where, uh, you know, she's maybe uploading pictures with her boyfriend, etc., um, but is, uh, you know, more restricted and, and uh, the content of which can't be seen um, unless it's, um, uh, you know, um, un unless you're on the friend list. So um, I believe that I haven't specifically interviewed um, young women who use TikTok, but um, I, I do understand that there are very sophisticated ways in which, um, you know, they straddle this line of uh, public and private and, and you know, I also feel like um, young women have always been taking risks, um, you know, uh, as a way of um, asserting um, their need for pleasure. Um, and I think that's something that happens both with technology um, and in offline spaces. And I believe that um, they're aware that the use of technology like this comes with some sort of risk. Um, it comes with surveillance, um, but it's a risk they take. Um, so, yeah. Thanks. So, sorry, when I said the question is for Sujata and Sidra, this was not from me. It was from the person who asked the question. So, Sidra, if you want to answer. 
Yeah, I agree with everything Sujata said. I think what we also have to confront is that like TikTok is not just uniquely appealing to women or to working class people. I mean, it's uniquely appealing. There's something about the app that is just, it's the algorithm of the app. It is designed in such a way. I mean, it's compelling to Maham. It's compelling to me when you're on there. So, so it's distinctive from other social media apps in general, not just for women or South Asian women or working class women. So, so that's one thing. But the other thing also, I think, related to the women I was spending time with is that uh, women have a real desire to express their creativity, to play, to play with sound. And other apps just don't enable it in that same way, right? So Instagram, of course, you can have filters and you can look beautiful and, and it's adding on new features. But TikTok, in addition to the algorithm, which really knows what you're going to like, provides you with a forum to play with your identity and your creativity in a really outstanding ways, I think, compared to other apps. So I think this is one thing that enabled, like women just are attracted to it more than they are to other apps. And uh, the other thing that I think is interesting to think about is that some apps don't allow you to be as invisible as other apps. So for example, Facebook, right? If you have a Facebook account, your brother's going to know about it. Your father's going to know about it. And sometimes you'll be expected to add them to your account because social media can actually enhance the surveillance of women because it provides male family members or any family members to also surveil women in digital spaces. So you may make a fake account and you may have a, a second account like Sujata is saying, but then you might have su the suggested friends function. So certain apps like TikTok actually allow you to be more invisible. And you know, researchers have found the same thing for Twitter in other contexts, like young people prefer to use Twitter over Facebook because they can just hide in the crowds. So I think that's another reason why TikTok in comparison to Facebook and Instagram has encouraged women to use it more beyond, of course, the pure attraction of the app, I think. Uh, though I do think I'll caveat by saying we do need more research and more comparative research that specifically asks women about their attitude towards Facebook and compares them to the attitude towards TikTok, which we don't have yet or I haven't come across yet. Thanks, Sedra. Um, okay, I there's a question here that I'm actually super intrigued by. Um, and I, I don't know who's the right person, so I'm just going to put it out there. Is there any uh, research on uh, older people using TikTok in South Asia? And I'm actually going to invert that question a little bit, which is you all, during your research, um, you know, come across older people in South Asia using TikTok and what has your, like, what have you gleaned or learned from that? Um, I'll take this one. Um, actually, surprisingly, I found older people, especially in Pakistan, using TikTok just as much as the younger crowd, but for very different reasons. So like I said, mom, TikTok is a thing. And these are grandmothers, not just young mothers, but like because of course women marry young in Pakistan so they become grandmothers fairly younger but still like they're making like a me TikTok kind of thing where they're talking very homely they're sharing totkas they're sharing that they miss their daughters after they married off their kids and how they feel so lonely um, so there's also that side of TikTok that I think deserves some attention and then obviously this panel is about women generally, but I think there is a large, large, large presence of old men on TikTok as well. And these are our WhatsApp uncles who've translated to TikTok as well. And there's a lot of like political commentary going on and then just sharing all sorts of conspiracies on TikTok and their opinion on developments and very aggressive, um, yeah, basically WhatsApp uncle style um, TikToks and then singing old Bollywood songs, poetry, poetry TikTok is also very, very popular among older generation. Um, so yeah, I think it's a very good comparison, but there's definitely a big presence of uh, the older lot on TikTok as well. Would anyone else like to share? No. Okay. Um, then we have, this is interesting. Um, so Pramila is asking, she's saying that Instagram has been known to cause body image issues among young women. Um, what kind of mental health issues came about with TikTok use among young women? And I guess I would 
add to that, um, which is not just mental health issues, but I guess we didn't get to this at all, um, which is, you know, TikTok, um, the app, the way the infrastructure is built, the, you know, the, the, the fact that you don't have to be uh, literate, all of that. So it, it gives you all of these options and diversity, right? But I guess what we didn't talk about is the ways in which TikTok may limit people maybe because of its infrastructure or because of other reasons. So yeah, does anyone have any thoughts about, yeah, the limitations, but also if it causes or if it's known or suspected to cause certain health, mental health issues more than others? I guess no one wants to say anything bad about TikTok. There's no limitations to the app, apparently. <laughs> it's only all good. I think we should definitely mention the censorship and harassment aspect of this, which I think is indirect, but it's very much related to mental health. So in Pakistan, for instance, women TikTokers have faced a lot of harassment. Like recently, there was a TikTok controversy about a woman setting fire for the purpose of creating TikTok and later she clarified that the bushes were already on fire, but the fact that she became an opportunist sort of to use this opportunity to make a TikTok and she faced a lot of harassment in the past. We've seen Harin Shah and a lot of controversies. So harassment is definitely a big, the more popular you become, um, the more harassment you face, which is not very specific to TikTok only, but also other platforms. But this is one aspect where TikTok is also not doing much to protect these women. Um, and then also censorship aspect of things, because in Pakistan specifically, morality, immorality and obscenity has been a big theme for and reasoning behind banning TikTok. So do women, women feel pressured by these um, censorship moves to filter themselves or um, yeah, cut down on the way or yeah, basically restrict themselves on these platforms. Also, what does TikTok do again to protect? Because right now they're complying full on with Pakistan government to, to be able to stay unbanned in Pakistan. But then how does that impact these women or gender across genders? How does this impact how they exercise their rights on this platform? It's definitely something worth mentioning. Um, just to add to what Ramsha is saying, I think the surveillance um, aspect of TikTok, uh, again, the, turning that question around, right, uh, the ways in which um, while, they use, while migrant workers use TikTok to talk about their conditions, that can also result in, therefore, surveillance uh, actors, the structures of surveillance through other migrant workers, as well as employers and gatekeepers um, that sort of scold them for posting some of the content that they post. Um, so I think that would be some, that would be a dimension that is important to think about um, as well. Yeah. Um, I think just specifically addressing the question of um, I think mental health issues among young women. Um, I don't actually know of research specifically on TikTok. I think, but my question is more around you know how do we react to young women expressing sexual agency, even outside these social media platforms, right? Um, there are certain ideas we have about what is age-specific sexuality. And anytime young women um, transgress those expectations or, or express their sexuality in a certain way, um, we, we look for language that, um, you know, uh, comes from, um, that sounds like we are, um, coming from a place of wanting to protect girls, right? Um, and I feel like there is a certain way in which those fears, are specific, um, especially kind of um, um, coalesce around technology, um, coalesce around young women's use of technology. So um, I don't want to discount that, uh, you know, there may be specific kind of uh, pressures that young women on social media face. But I think the larger question is, uh, to me at least, is about how we think about young women's sexuality. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's also important to think about it as an ecosystem, you know, like because I think some of the harassment doesn't like happen from TikTok. It's when videos get posted on other platforms and that drives like harassment towards it. Because I mean, I was an early adopt adopter of TikTok and back in the day when we were studying it, one of the things that like really surprised us was that there was like the comment sections were so positive and wholesome back in the day. And 
which was so unlike like we would look at the same person's content on YouTube and the backlash was so like bad. So that has shifted now because the audience has expanded, of course. But I think a lot of the time what we see is that, you know, when something gets posted on a gossip website or on like, you know, is shared on national TV or like, you know, other like influential people comment on things. That is when we see a lot of the harassment coming back uh, to the platform. And also the fact that a lot of content creators openly talk about this also, like, you know, like they'll put the reply function on TikTok is often used to like, you know, really hone in on some of these like comments to say, okay, you're saying this to me and do you know how I feel about it? Or, um, or like, you know, to get more support from like, you know, people who are supporting you uh, in the comments. So I think that is also um, another way that, you know, like people are navigating it within the platform itself some of the time, yeah. Yeah, I really like the reply function because I think it's such a it's such a good way to like own your narrative. It's like, oh, this is what you said. Well, this is my response. You know, it's so neat. Um, okay, with that, I think uh, we're going to end here. Is there something that one of the panelists wants to say that they feel is important but they didn't get a chance to share? Now is your opportunity. No, okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Um, thanks to all of the viewers. Uh, thank you to all of the panelists. Thank you to Michelle. Thank you to MIT. Um, and yeah, just um, I hope this. I hope everyone enjoyed it um, and learned something. And yeah, thanks. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Maham. Thanks, Maham. Thank you. Thank you.